tension problem and we have a little angular motion, rotational motion stuff all in one. So let's work through this together. And the key thing is just going to be going through it slowly. And one thing to keep in mind is we really want to practice with our language because this is a slightly older problem. So if you were faced with a problem like this on this year's exam, you're going to really have to know how to explain things using um, you know, paragraphs and writing your own experiment and just being able to write everything out um, in paragraph form. So we have two masses, M1 and M2, connected by light cables, basically massless cables, we don't care. We have, um, they're connected to the cylinders, radii R1 and R2. The cylinders are originally connected to each other but are free to rotate without friction, so that's important to know. Um, and it's also nice we're given the moment of inertia, which we don't have to worry about. If we remember the moment of inertia, we don't have to worry about this little constant. We're given that. So that's going to be also very convenient for this problem. So they are in equilibrium off the bat. So for part A, determine M2 such that the system will remain in equilibrium. And when we have a rotating object, the sum of the torques is equal to zero. This is rotational equilibrium, which we should be pretty familiar with at this point. Now, it, it doesn't matter, I guess, if I look at it very closely. It's kind of hard to tell, but it looks like M2 is causing a clockwise rotation. So um, that means it's negative. So essentially T1 is equal to T2. So if we plug in, remember torque is equal to RF sine theta, but since this these are exerted at 90 degrees, sine theta is gonna be equal to one. So basically we just have force times um, distance from the rotational point. Now, when we are talking about the force of gravity here, which is the force that's being exerted, <clears throat> we have M1 times G times R1 equals M2 times G times R2. Now, Gs are on both sides, so I can cancel. Now I can just plug in. So I'm given M1 is 20 kilograms. R1 is also given to me 1.5 meters equals m2 is what we're looking for and this r2 is i'm sorry i had that backwards r2 is 1.5 meters based on this information here which i changed this 0 0.5 meters so multiply that out 20 times 0.5 divided by 1.5 and we should get that m2 is equal to 6.67 kilograms. Okay, so for part B, we have the mass M2 is removed and the system is released from rest. So let me just erase this, give myself a little more room. Okay, now M2 is released. Now this object is not in free fall because the tension or the rope is still connected to the pulley. So there's gonna be some resistance. Now I'm not exactly sure um, if, I, if I look at part C, this I'm looking for the tension here, I'm looking for angular acceleration. I'm really not sure which one I'm going to find first, but they are going to both work together and we'll see. I honestly don't know yet which one I'm going to end up finding first, but what we do need to find is start with the sum of the tensions, some of the torques in, you know, we're talking about rotational motion, that's equal to moment of inertia times alpha. And then separately, maybe down here, if I want to use some of the forces, well, here we have the force of gravity and tension is exerting upwards equal to ma. So we have the force of gravity minus tension equals ma. And then when I plug in for the torques, the tension is exerting the torque. So 
if I if I RF, I'm going to have the tension times R1 equal to the moment of inertia, which we're given, times this angular acceleration. And now here, coming up, is going to be an important relationship to help me solve this problem. And I need to know my relationships, so this might be something I really want to study, between linear and rotational motion. So when we're talking about angular acceleration, or if we're talking about linear acceleration, that's equal to alpha times r. Or if we think about it the other way, angular, this is my alpha, is equal to linear acceleration over r. Either one of those is fine. Now, I'm looking for angular acceleration. I don't really care about the linear acceleration for this problem. So let's take this and let's plug it in here. So I'm going to get mg minus tension equals m times alpha r. Okay. Now what we're going to end up having is both of these equations have a tension and a angular acceleration term. So I'm not really sure which one I want to solve for first, but Let's see. Go ahead Let's see which and one. set one of these equal so we can eliminate some variables. So if I divide by i up here, I get that alpha or angular acceleration is equal to tension times r1 over i. So let's plug that in. mg minus t equals m. My alpha here is going to be equal to tension times R1 over I times this R. So this looks like it is confusing. I'm actually not going to um, plug, plug in or distribute. So if I just start plugging in, the mass is 20 kilograms times acceleration due to gravity. This is 200 newtons. I don't know what tension is. Okay, the mass is 20 kilograms. We're given that the rotational inertia is 45. That's over, sorry. Back that up. That's why you gotta stay nice and organized. Okay, so tension over 45 times meter squared times R1, which is 0.5, so times 0 0.5 times 0 0.5 meters. Now I'm just going to multiply it out, and i got to squeeze it in over here. So I have 200 newtons minus T equals, on this side, we have 20 times 0 0.5 times 0 0.5 divided by... 45 equals 0 0.11 t. If I add a t to both sides, add a t to both sides, and then I get 200 divided by 1.11, I get that the tension is equal to 180 newtons. Perfect. I expect it to be a little less than this 200 newtons because this is object is accelerating downward. So conceptually, that makes sense. Now I have the tension. So it should be relatively simple to figure out if I use this line, we plug it in 180 newtons times R1 0 0.5 equals it's 45 kilograms times meter squared times alpha, plug in, so 180 times 0.5 divided by 45, and I get that the rotational acceleration is equal to 2 radians per second squared. And I'm going to erase this all before starting part D, but hopefully we are okay with part A, part B, and part C. So let me see if I could is this going to clear? Let me just is erased. Moving on to part D. Determine the linear speed of m1 
at the time it's descended one meter. And this is important to know because I know if it has descended one meter, what that means is that I've lost gravitational potential energy. So part D is definitely going to be a conservation of energy problem. So initially, we're just focused on this block right now. So initially, all that that object has is gravitational potential energy, or MGH. And now that is converted into kinetic energy. Now the block's in motion, and we'll assume that its potential is zero when it falls one meter, right? Because we don't really, you know, care. We'll say its maximum potential energy is at a height of one meter. And also, this block's causing the pulley to rotate. So one half times I omega squared. Now, here's where it's a little tricky because just like our relationship with the acceleration before. I don't know this angular or speed, but I do know that omega is equal to linear velocity over r, or we might have seen in class, velocity, linear equals rotational velocity times r. Now I'm ready to start plugging in, and I can solve. So we're saying this has a mass, let me put it here, 20 kilograms, 10 meters per second squared, height of 1 meter, equals 1 half mv squared, plus, or actually I'm going to plug in 20 there, right, 20 kilograms v squared, plus 1 half, 45 kilograms times meter squared times not omega squared let's change that to v squared over over r which is 0.5 meters and that's squared as well okay so now let's multiply everything out so i have 20 times 10 times 1 200 Again, with 200. I'm not going to worry about the units right now because we know um, what to expect for velocity. So 1 half times 20. This is 10 v squared plus here I got to do some plugging in. It's 0.5 squared, 0.25. So 0.5 times 45 divided by 0.25 equals 90 v squared. Now these we can combine. So we get 200 equals 100 v squared. Let's get v squared by itself. Divide both sides by 100. So 2 equals v squared. Obviously this is units of meters squared per second squared. Take the square root of both sides and hopefully you know this, the square root of 2. Um, when we're working with some isosceles triangles doing Pythagorean theorem, we get the linear speed when it's fallen 1 meter is 1.4 meters per second. And we are done.